everyone. It's Devorah Katz from Chalakrums.com, coming at you on the heels of a wonderful Adina Sokloff uh, Purim presentation. Uh, before I start, obviously, much thanks to Adina Sokloff from Parenting Simply and, of course, to the OU for sponsoring our lunchtime webinar. Today, we're going to talk about Purim. Seems like the right time to be doing that. And um, I think I'm going to start with a story because that, you know, that's what I enjoy. Uh, so this is many years ago, my daughter, who is 13 now, I guess she was about two at the time. And uh, for me, what I was really excited about was her Purim. And I spent a lot of time and energy making it all wonderful and exciting. And she had a cute little bear costume and her little brother had the same matching bear costume. They looked adorable. And she woke up not feeling well. Well, I don't care. It's Purim. You need to feel great. And uh, we delivered her Mishloch Manot to her friends and her teachers, and we're having such a nice time. And finally, I look over at her, and she's burning up. <laughs> and I take her home, and I take her temperature, and she's running a fever. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've totally undermined all values of giving a, you know, kid-friendly Purim when I was as unfriendly as possible to my kid. So I always think about that story as I sort of rush into performance mode for Purim and I sort of have to rein myself in and hold myself back to make sure that I truly am focusing on what's important, which, you know, should probably be my kids. Um, so I will say to my credit, once I realized she was running a fever and I was a terrible parent, um, we definitely slowed things down and gave her a little bit more of a calm, put your pajamas on, Purim. Uh, so I, I guess the story comes to illustrate a couple of things. One is we always talk, or as Adina mentioned, we talk about how to help your kids be a hero. But sometimes as parents, we need to be heroes for our kids. We need to be the heroes. And there are any number of ways that you can do this. Uh, when we say, you know, man or woman plans and God laughs, it's absolutely true. Anytime that we are tied into a specific amount of time, right, I have Purim, it's a day, there's always something that can come in, you know, you're running a fever, you have a virus, whatever it is, things can sort of get in the way of our plans. And so one of the things that I like doing for most Jewish holidays, but today we're going to focus on Purim, is the lead up, right? I like to set the stage for the holiday in the week or two leading up to the holiday so that if there is an unforeseen circumstance or if your kid just doesn't like Purim, and we'll talk about that kid in a minute, uh, we've still been successful in creating this positive environment. So, uh, for example, my third child, who is a redhead, and that's his personality in every sense of the word, uh, he recently had a birthday. And I said to him, what are we going to do? Should we invite your whole class? Should we just invite some friends? What is it that you want for your birthday? And I'm all ready to go big. You know, I'm decorating the cake in my mind. It's all going to be beautiful. And he says... I want to have only my family. I want us to rent a movie and have takeout together with a movie. So I, that's his personality. That's what he is going to love. And so part of me needs to acknowledge who it is that my kid is and how I can make the day most successful for him. So my other children decorated the living room. They turned it into a movie theater. They printed up tickets. We made popcorn. So we did it to the highest extreme possible, but we took into consideration who the kid was. And mostly we took it into consideration only because the kid told us who he was. Otherwise, I would have been out there doing things he really didn't want to be done. Perm is the perfect example of this. There are kids, most notably even that kid, who will spend 364 days a year talking about his costume. It changes every 48 hours, and I have to feign interest for 12 months, knowing full well that tomorrow it's going to be a different costume. Tomorrow he has a different plan. He's going to dress up as something different. But it's the anticipation for him that is so significant, and I have to take that anticipation into account. But I also have kids where the day is just a complete sensory overload. And really, if we're talking about the things that we're putting on our kids, it's, a, it's tons of sugar, there's no routine, there are people coming and going for people who are scared of costumes. It could be a very potentially a very unpleasant holiday. So the first thing that I would say in preparing for Purim is really know your audience. And your audience is your kids. You're going to be the hero for your kids. So if there's a kid that hates Purim and is overwhelmed by it, 
Acknowledge that. If there's a kid that goes all in and this is the year to shine and they're spraying their hair green, acknowledge that also. We sort of want to give this freedom of expression in all venues, meaning for the kid who doesn't love it and for the kid who does love it. Um, I would say that for the children who enjoy routine or require routine, one of the things that I find successful is literally writing a schedule of the day for your kids to see. This is the time we're going to listen to Megila. When Megila is over, we're going to go home. Everyone is going to collect the Mishlochem, a note that they have made. And this is the map of how we're going to deliver them. We're going to go here and there and there, whatever it is, so that my child has a very strong sense of understanding of what is going to happen. For a kid who doesn't like surprises, this isn't the ideal day. So you want to make sure that you are making it as comfortable and user-friendly as possible. You're not hiding anything and you're explaining. People are going to come to our house. We're going to go to other people's houses. And that's how the day unwinds. For all kids, the ones who love it and the ones who don't love it as much, I would say you want to schedule in rest time at some point, meaning in between after your Mishlochema note have been delivered, before the Suda, you want to make sure that your kids have an hour of quiet. And forgive me to all parenting gods and goddesses out there, if that means turning on the TV for an hour, letting them go on the computer for an hour, whatever it is, you want to give them that unwind time. Because if they're going full gas for an entire day, it is just a recipe for meltdowns. And this truly is the day of meltdowns. Uh, I remember very well when we went to Disney, you know, I read all the books before going to Disney. You feel like you're doing it. You've got to do it great. And so I read everything and I was prepared. And one of the best pieces of advice that I got from reading my books on Disney was this. You assume that you are taking your kids to the happiest place on earth and everyone must be happy. It's a lie. Your kids are the same personality they are back in their house at home as they are in Disney. Kids that get frazzled, kids that need to eat on time, kids that need direction, kids that need encouragement, everybody's the same. It's not that the magic wand hits you and you're totally a different person full of happiness and joy and love when you're in Disney. Not true. You're going to be the same person if you're in Disney and you're going to be the same person if you're at home. On Perm, which is this great day and it's full of candy and it's so fun and friendly and exciting, you're going to be the same person and that's okay. The person you are is pretty awesome. Your kids, I'm sure, are wonderfully awesome. But we need to acknowledge who they are and allow them to be who they are on that day. That means if there's a school or a shul carnival or a community event that one or two of your younger kids will be scared of or overwhelmed by, it's okay. It's okay not to push them and it's okay not to go. It's okay to know who your kid is. Uh, and I think that that's really one of the strongest messages because it alleviates the pressure of the day. It alleviates this need of making sure that all Mishloch Mano go out and making sure that the kid, it's fine. Whatever works for them, you're going to allow it to work for them and that will be successful for them. In the two weeks or so leading up to Purim, I like to maximize um, dinner time. We are fortunate enough that we eat dinner together every night. And so one of the nice things that we do and I've talked about this often, is bringing the vocabulary of Purim to your kids. That means that the words that are new and unfamiliar to us, that we use only at this holiday, we're comfortable talking about them frequently with our kids. You want to work the words Megillah, um, Gragor, or Rashan for your noisemaker. You want to tell the story of what happens, and you want to explain what goes on on Purim, so that the kid, first of all, feels successful at school when they can share their knowledge about Purim, but also so the kid really feels part of the anticipation leading up to Purim. So it's not something that just sort of falls on him or falls on her quickly one day in and out, but rather you want to use this opportunity as a teaching moment or moments as experience that leads up to Purim. Uh, and there are a bunch of cute ways to do it. Uh, some are more obvious and some are just little ways to um, to encourage dialogue and to pass over that knowledge. So obviously we have a hamantashen day where the kids are making hamantashen. So that's a great process. I always find that um, kitchen time is great talking time. Kids seem to open up. There's no TV. There's Maybe there's some music in the background. But they have this opportunity to really connect with you. So one of the things that you can do is obviously your standard favorite recipe or recipes on challahcrumbs.com that will um, give you the perfect hamantaschen recipe. But you want to talk about how you fill your hamantaschen. Are you doing 
jellies and jams or chocolates or peanut butter. There's a whole discussion to be had, and that's a great afternoon activity, especially for younger kids. You know, it's not a particularly difficult cookie to make, and that's really something that you can make and freeze before Purim. So that's one way of talking about Purim. Um, I like doing, um, again, I mentioned that dinner times are uh, big times for us. And so, um, you know, we can sort of chart the growth of our kids through uh, highs and lows. You know, not all the time. Let's be honest. It's not the Brady Bunch in my house. But a couple of times a week, we play highs and lows where we go around the table. And um, each kid says a high and a low of that day. So that we're hearing what's going on. And now we're going to add something in before Purim. So, for example, one night I will serve um, dinner and everybody will have a mask just next to their plate. Why? Just so that we can say, Purim's coming up, isn't that exciting? I don't need more than that, depending on the age of your kids, really, two, three, four, five-year-old. What more do you need than to be just a little bit happy? You have a little mask to put on. Everybody wears their masks at dinner. It's so nice and fun and cute. Wonderful. You don't really need more than that. But what I've done is I've introduced the idea of Purim to the kids in a very, very simple way. Um, one night I'll put um, these guys. Oh, the cheap brand. That should make noise, but doesn't. I'll put a um, little noise maker so that I can, again, talk about um, when we make noise. You know, the younger kids can share. Oh, when we hear Haman, who's Haman? So again, I'm offering up this opportunity to discuss, um, to discuss Purim with the kids. It's very simple. It doesn't take a lot of time. Pretty much anything I find, you can find at Michael's or Joann's or Oriental Trading. Um, they're all very cheap and very easily accessible. And so that's something that is an easy, nice thing to do with your kids. As kids get older, you want to incorporate crafts. I usually pick a theme and focus on it. This year, I did with my younger kids, uh, Noisemakers or Rahashan. So this one of my children made, so we'll, you know, leave the artistic... Um, discussion on the side, but this was a very simple project to make. If I could deconstruct it, I would show you that this is a matchbox that has no matches in it. And um, and then my son pulled it out and stuck rice in. You can hear that. Rice. And then I actually used contact paper here for them to cover it. I didn't love it. You can just use regular um, wrapping paper and some scotch tape to cover it up. And then I found these beaded stickers and um, they covered it in beaded stickers. We added a popsicle stick into the matchbox. And it's a very, very simple Rashan. They're very excited. Uh, another thing that's nice is my kindergarten age, my four-year-old, brought his to school to show his teacher. Um, so he got very proud of it. And that also gave us, really, this project, uh, 20 minutes, maybe, maximum. It's things you should have lying around your house, whatever stickers you've got around, whatever popsicle sticks you've got around. Um, and it's a really, really easy project, and they're very excited to bring it to shul. Another thing I talk about often with all Jewish holidays is giving your child ownership of the experience. Meaning, I can come and show them what it is that Purim is and how it's done, and they can see me in the kitchen working really hard. But that's not what I want their experience to be. I want their experience to be very authentic and very much theirs. They're going to decorate the table. They're going to pick um, the, the Suda, the theme of Suda, of what we're eating and how we're eating it and why we're eating it. Because I want them to really take on this idea that it's a holiday that's a family holiday and that they connect to that holiday. Uh, that becomes something that's important. My eyes are going to wander while I check my notes because I'm always nervous that I forget something. Um, hmm? I'm doing pretty well. Uh, let me show you a couple of other ideas for um, for Rashanim. That's one of the things that we're doing this year. Um, I guess what I would suggest is taking a jar of baby food or something that, that is that size. Again, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, everybody loves storage containers. Uh, in the past few years, you can find pretty much any size of anything at Target, Michael's, online. But you're looking for something that's the size of a baby uh, baby food jar. And what you're going to do with that is you're going to, depending on the age of the kid, again, you can be using stickers, you can be using, I'm not sure why these became very popular in my house recently, but all these really colorful buttons. Um, the buttons can actually be double purpose, right? They can be used inside the baby jar to make the Rashan sound, the sound of the grugger, or they can be glued on the outside. Uh, depending on the age is really what you're going to work with. So um, for my kids that are not necessarily quiet through Megillah reading, 
what I will do is I will fill a baby jar with them. This is their anticipation. They get excited with M&Ms or with Mike and Ike's so that when they shake it, they can hear it. And it is the purpose of a Rashan of a noisemaker. But also when they get bored, because let's be honest, Megillat Esther is not a simple thing for young kids to sit through. Uh, when they get bored, they can open up the baby food jar that they've decorated and they can start um, eating a little bit <laughs> during the Megillah so that their noisemaker gets a little bit quieter as time goes by. We're not as concerned with the amount of noise they're going to make. Um, that's another Rashan that's very popular. Depending on your kid's interests, um, you can make a Lego Rashan, either making it out of Lego or borrowing some Lego pieces. Again, they can fit into anything. As we all know as parents, most things make a lot of noise. So even if you want to do a simple Rashan with a Ziploc bag and Lego pieces and the kid's name on the front so she or he can shake it throughout, that's great. Or any sort of jar, big jar, medium-sized jar, if you put Legos in, it's again something that they enjoy. So you're taking things that are meaningful to them and you're incorporating them into the world of Purim. Uh, one of my favorites is always um, place cards, making place cards with whoever is staying, uh, with whoever is coming for the meal. That's another great thing that your kid can be involved in for the Suda uh, before it happens so that the Suda can be set with them in mind. Um, Mishloch Manot is another big deal depending on who your kid is and what your kid enjoys. I have one child who likes to give to his four closest friends and that's enough. And I have one child who recognizes the, um, the economics of giving more, getting more. And so he'll give to, you know, his entire grade of 30 kids. So depending on who it is and what you want to give, you want to decide in advance with your kids um, make a list of who they're giving to and map it out. Different kids can go in different directions. My older kids can go on their own. My younger kids need us. Um, I find that I love mapping with my kids, meaning you're making a map of the area. It's also smart for your kids to know, you know, their way around. But you're making a map and the kid has that paper to hold uh, in his or her hand as they're walking to figure out exactly uh, the route that they're going on to deliver their Mishloach Manot. I use this technique with almost everything. I will say that for Simchat Torah, when my kid was, I think that he was four at the time, and it was, it was just a lot going on. And I said to him, this is what we're going to do. And I took actually a big Bristol board, and I said, we are going to go to Shul. You are going to go with Abba. You are going to kiss the Torah. You are going to get a candy, and you are going to come home. And he memorized it, meaning there was a lot of safety in knowing exactly what was going to happen. You usually walk into shul and there's no one dav there's no one dancing. That's very confusing for a four-year-old. But the fact that he knew, oh, Simchat Torah, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna dance with my father, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna kiss the Torah, I'm gonna get a candy. In his mind, he had set very clear parameters. And he was so excited that for the week leading up to Simchat Torah, remember my uh every night we eat dinner together. So he would take that poster and he would explain it to us every single night. We would have to sit through it, listen to him, tell us exactly what was going to happen. But on Simchat Torah, he was very successful. It really worked out well for him. The same idea with Mishloch Manot. Um, as we all know, Mishloch Manot is just um, some kind of elaborate ruse to take all Halloween candy and repackage it for Purim. Uh, I usually will give my kids a specific amount that they can eat right then. I've heard lots of different views on this. Um, but usually what I do is I give them a bag. They take out their most prized, wonderful candies that they can't live without. And then we make sure that we donate the rest of it to the less fortunate. That way, uh, there's always an element of charity in, um, in what we do. We want kids to understand that there's a bigger world out there that's bigger than them and um, their immediate needs. Uh, so we enjoy that very much. I have friends who say to their kids, you can eat whatever you want all Purim long, but the minute that this holiday ends, we are shutting it down. And so the kids stuff their faces for the day, and then they're done. Not certain that that's really the best for stomach aches, but at least you know that it is a limited amount and not an unlimited amount. Again, each kid, you sort of need to recognize what is best for them, what their limits should be, uh, and how those limits should be enforced. I always, um, we feel very strongly that at the end of Purim, 
Um, our Suda ends early enough that our kids come home at an hour where they can take their baths, they can take their showers, they can put on pajamas, and they can relax. Meaning the day is so intense, the day has so much going on, that really what we want to make sure is that we're the grown-ups here. And I, um, and I sort, of, sort of want to tangent into the world of drinking on Purim, but really what I want to say about it is don't do that. Um, but even in a limited amount, you want to make sure that your kids understand that they are the focal point of the day. And as the day winds down, and you've done well by them, meaning you have spent those two weeks leading up to it with different crafts that you can find on the site or different coloring pages. Also, I would say the same way um, we often pack a bag when we go to shul because you're not sure how long a kid is going to be successful for. And here there's this additional element of pressure that you're not really supposed to, you know, you need to hear every word of the Megillah. And if you have a young kid, know what your kids are capable of, right? Don't set them up for failure. You don't want to be frustrated because your three-year-old needs to leave. If you know your three-year-old is going to need to leave, arrange a time to go to Megillah a little bit with your three-year-old, and then you'll hear it later on in the night or in the day. Uh, you want to make sure that you set your kid up to succeed and uh, and not to be a, set, a source of frustration. Um, so we'll bring a book, uh, we'll bring a bag with some books, with some more candy, maybe with another noisemaker that has extra candy. Um, you just want to keep your kid quietly entertained for as long as possible. But if you have a solid lead up to the day with craft projects, with activities, with coloring pages, with discussions at dinner, with little treats going into their bags, sometimes I'll just stick one of these in their lunch bags um, on their way to school as the days lead up to perm, just to get in the feel of it. Really, you are truly being your children's heroes by championing their interests, by knowing what they do best, and by helping them have a very successful Purim. Obviously, Chag Sameach, a wonderful Purim to you all. Uh, check out our site. we got some great things going on there. Thank you, OU. Thank you, Adina Sokloff, and take care. Bye-bye. Purim, you need to feel great. And uh, we delivered her Mishloch Manot to her friends and her teachers, and we're having such a nice time. And finally, I look over at her, and she's burning up. <laughs> and I take her home, and I take her temperature, and she's running a fever, and I thought, oh my gosh, I've totally undermined all values of giving a, you know, kid-friendly Purim when I was as unfriendly as possible. To Hi, everyone. It's Devor Katz from Chalakrums.com. Coming at you on the heels of a wonderful Adina Sokloff uh, Purim presentation. Uh, before I start, obviously, much thanks to Adina Sokloff from Parenting Simply and, of course, to the OU for sponsoring our lunchtime webinar. Today, we're going to talk about Purim. Seems like the right time to be doing that. And um, I think I'm going to start with a story to my kid. So I always think about that story as I sort of rush into performance mode for Purim. And I sort of have to rein myself in and hold myself back to make sure that I truly am focusing on what's important, which, you know, should probably be my kids. Um, so I will say to my credit, once I realized she was running a fever and I was a terrible parent, um, we definitely slowed things down and gave her a little bit more of a calm, put your pajamas on, Purim. Uh, so I, I guess the story comes to illustrate a couple of things. One is we always talk, or as Adina mentioned, we talk about how to help your kids be a hero. But sometimes as parents, we need to be heroes for our kids. We need to be the heroes. And there are any number of ways that you can do this. Uh, when we say, you know, man, because that, you know, that's what I enjoy. Uh, so this is many years ago. My daughter, who is 13 now, I guess she was about two at the time. And uh, for me, what I was really excited about was her Purim. And I spent a lot of time and energy making it all wonderful and exciting. And she had a cute little bear costume. And her little brother had the same matching bear costume. They looked adorable. And she woke up not feeling well. Well, I don't care. It's 